Thank you, Hans. Our God reigns. Amen. Creator God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. During the past five weeks, Pastor Veronica and I have been exploring the life and ministry of Jesus during Hyde Park Union's weekly Bible study. Thursdays at 6 p.m., by the way. Comparing different accounts of Jesus' beginnings, the different retellings of his journey from newly baptized prophet to miracle worker and teacher. And finally, the differing accounts of Jesus' betrayal, suffering, and death. This leads us to new questions of the meaning of the text we hold sacred. Out of all those readings, I often find the ascension to be the most spiritually disturbing. Jesus fulfills his promise and defeats death, the most vicious and persistent of the evils that beset humanity. The living word of God demonstrates that he has the last say, that, he will, that we will be saved through faith. But after this revelation, after the glory of his resurrection and proclamation, the, the disciples are left alone. They are tasked with entering the mess of the world with a message of hope, a message will, which will be violently suppressed and then, and proof of the world's fallenness, co-opted and turned to the needs of the very structures which killed the Messiah. We read in Acts and the epistles of the splitting of the apostles into factions. We see the infighting and the fear of followers who are cast into desperation and uncertainty. Those who are left behind, what are they to do? The joy of the early Jesus community fades as they come to realize that the prophesied end is yet to come and not yet here. Those who are left behind, what are they to do? They must persist without their friend, their mentor, their blessed connection to the divine. Those who are left behind, what are they to do? What are they to feel and understand? What are they to hope for in their grief? Those must have been the questions echoing in their minds and a new reality where the messianic has been miraculously achieved, but they are tasked with a great mission in this aftermath. We know that these were the thoughts and fears which guided the actions of the apostles in the decades to come, partly from the witness explored in the epistles and acts, but also because all of us know what it is to persist in the wake of tragedy to continue to work set before us when we are confronted with a world made lesser by the loss of those we hold dear. We too are disciples of Christ and we too are left behind. What are we to do? The first time I felt left behind, the first time I had to ask myself the desperate question of how I will persist in the world and continue with the mission of my calling it was when I lost my mother when I was 21 years old. She was taken suddenly by congestive heart failure at 2 a.m. on August 6, 2003. My mom had been very sick for a long time. I cared for her for nearly four years on my own as crippling arthritis, severe asthma, depression, and COPD stripped her of the joy from her life. I watched as illness isolated my mother, as her faith became fraught with the reality of a life, lived on the edge of poverty 
in constant pain. When she died, I took solace in the fact of her pain ending. But I also felt a sort of loneliness that beggars my ability to describe. After the funeral, I came home to an empty house realizing that in my entire life, I'd never been so alone. I was a middle school dropout with no skills or connections, had $400 to my name. What was I to do? I'd been left behind in a world that was seemingly hostile to my very existence. The confluence of Mother's Day, the Ascension and Pentecost always brings the hollowness of the moment to my mind. The pain of loss seldom has to do with those who are departed. It is those of us who are left behind who must find a way forward, find a way to persist in life unalterably changed. I know that many of you know the kinds of emotions that come with losing a loved one and the ache of those days that remind us of what we lost. My mother was a supremely kind woman. Strangers would tell her their life stories unprompted, somehow knowing that she was driven by compassion and the need to care for others. She used to tell me that her dream of heaven was to finally be able to dance again. The most surprising thing for me was to wake up the day after her death and see the world still spinning, people still living their lives because everything had changed in my world. I was left behind, what was I to do? He withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. In these words, we can read a profound hope. This hope I think is not found in imagining the mystery of life after death or an ideal existence at the right hand of the creator. The hope is found in those left behind, their persistence, their faith, and their mission are the hope of the church and can help us to unpack the hopes that guide our lives in the absence of those we love. In the void of loss, there is the possibility of something wondrous, something so miraculous that new ways of being emerge from the darkness of grief into the light of God's glory. In today's scripture reading, we can feel the joy of enlightenment as the mess messianic had come to pass through the person of Jesus as the Christ. And he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Their faith had been fulfilled and they had been chosen as witnesses to the word of God made flesh in their midst. Imagine what that must have felt like to know that your dear teacher had survived horrific suffering to be reborn in God's glory. If you close your eyes, you can hear their laughter. You can feel the relief in their exaltation. Jesus continues, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is the suffering to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things and see I am sending upon you what my father promised. Stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The week between now and Pentecost is our symbolic recreation of this moment. The Christian church rises from this moment from the patience of the apostles in that upper room as they pray fervently for revelation, some sign of what they are to be and what they are to do. We know from the historic record that this was a time of worry and stress as a hit from those who had slain their leader. At any moment they could be found out and publicly tortured and murdered for their faith. We must give thanks for the privilege of being born in this country at this time, not made to answer for our beliefs. 
as we see in the world today, tensions between faith commitments and state power can give rise to cruelty and violent retribution. The synoptic gospels frame the ascension as both the metaphysical rising of Jesus into heaven and as validation for the steadfastness, steadfastness of the faithful. Matthew 28 ends with the great commission. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the creator, Christ and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with you to the end of the age. I am always with you. In Matthew, Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, but remains bound to the earth through his teachings and commandments. Just as those we have lost live on through our memories and our actions in accordance with the love they gave us. Jesus leaves us with the mission to teach and preach and witness to the glory of God. But the realization of this mission is difficult. We are to bring love to a world which constant, consistently turns from love toward domination. We're tasked with living through faith into the void left behind by the mere fact of death. Jesus pronounced the significance of his ministry, of his existence among us when he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven because his mission was complete. It was now up to those who had been left behind to fulfill their mission. They were called to bring the good news to the poor, to proclaim the release of the captives and healing to those who call upon the power of God. Jesus overcame death itself. All oppression can be overcome through the will of God, of love and justice. Then he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. In preparation for this sermon, I examined many artistic renderings of the ascension. Most showed the disciples huddled in confusion as Jesus is taken up in a cloud of light. Some, Je some show Jesus held aloft by angels, his hands outstretched, and still bleeding from the wounds of the crucifixion. Even in this supposed moment of exaltation, the tearing aside is still weeping blood. Even in this moment of blessing, we can see the confusion as to what is next. We can still feel the trauma of witness of what it means to be left behind. The joy of ascension of the uplifting of the soul from the pain of the world, warring with the concrete nature of loss. The continuing mission is to find blessing in the ruins of life. We only have to look at the news of this week to see the challenge of the faithful to persist in the world seemingly left behind by Jesus. I watched a physician on television giving an interview. The area around his mouth and nose darkened from inhaling the smoke from the funeral pyres burning in the ghettos of India. We see the devastation in Gaza as Asian enmities reignite. Looking at the scenes of chaos and blood, all I can see are the children being left alone in this world and rising of a new generation of hatred. In our own government, we are seeing bigotry, violence, and falsehoods rewarded through the cynical grasping for more and greater power. Where are we to find blessing in this mess? In my 
office at home, I have a stuffed elephant my wife and I bought last weekend. If you squeeze its belly, you can hear the heartbeat of our little girl. She was only 19 weeks along now, so the heartbeat is echoey and quick. It has the urgency of a life waiting to be born, to enter the mess of, the, of life with new hopes and new sorrows yet to come. Already I'm faced with knowing that someday I will have to leave her. Just as my mother left me, just as Jesus had to withdraw when it was time. I already feel that joy and confusion of experiencing the miraculous while still trapped in my own fears of what is to come. What kind of world am I inviting her into? What kind of world will be left to her to flourish in? What memories and loves will she remember when Mother's Day and Father's Day come and we are not there for her? It is important to understand that Jesus did not leave the disciples with only uncertain joy or responsibility and an amazing story to tell. Jesus left them with a profound hope that animates what it means to be Christian and to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is Acts chapter one, verse 11. In the first book, speaking of the gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized me with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And he had said this as they were watching, he was lifted up and the cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them he said, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Why do we allow grief and fear and loss to pull our attention from the possibilities of the world around us? We are left behind, but Jesus tells us that we are never left alone. The spirit of the Lord is upon us. The spirits of those who have left us behind live on in the love we show to one another and in the hope we have in God's coming kingdom on earth. There will be peace. If we open our minds to understand the scriptures, we can come to know that every day we wake to a world of miracles Every breath carries wonder and possibility. I thank God for the life of my mother and the memories my sister and I carry with us. I thank God that those memories will live on in my daughter, that the love she will experience is the commission left to me by those who have ascended. The stories we tell of Jesus are reminders of what the world could be, of the world yet to come through the demonstration of our love and the pursuit of justice. Repentance and forgiveness are already assured to all of humanity, but it is left to us to tell the story, to live the message. This means that we experience church as an embodiment of the blessing left to us. Every day we awake 
to the mystery of God's love and what it means to the world? What would it mean to search through the ruins to find God speaking to us in compassion and mercy for each other? What would it mean to believe that Jesus is here waiting for us to discover the reality of his teachings in the faces of the oppressed and those left behind in a world of domination? Over the next week, I ask you to seek out the God who is seeking you. Find the grace that has been left to you, to us, in the wake of tragedy and in the hope of Jesus as the Christ. If the gospel means anything, it means that the mystery of Jesus as the Christ is in his ascension and in his ever-present spirit, which is expressed in how we love one another. Amen.